So uh, tonight's session, social isolation, social connection or social division. So when Albert Camus wrote his novel, The Plague in 1947, it was widely known that it was an allegory of the Nazi occupation of Paris. However, in 2020, it seems to me that it's quite a prescient analysis of how people have reacted to our own, own plague crisis in the last uh, few months. And uh, in, I reread it, re it recently, and I must say, I was particularly taken by Camus' analysis that the plague exposes existing fractures in our societies. Now, we like to think that the current pandemic has bred a shared sense of community and solidarity. And indeed it has, as did, particularly in Australia, the amazing community response to the bushfires earlier this year. Yet I suspect it's also exposed some of our not very present qualities. Some of the things we're going to discuss tonight. For instance, why is it that more often than not, Australia's political leaders, when discussing the spread of the coronavirus, have resorted to the public shaming of individuals or classes of individuals, as often as appeal to the better angels of our natures. And all of this is happening at a time when in many countries around the world, people are beginning to view their political identity as core to their own personality and how they view the world on everything beyond political issues. So the question, the big question, I guess, for tonight is, is COVID bringing us together or pulling us apart? And for that, I'm truly thrilled that we've got a fantastic panel with us again tonight. We've got Rebecca Huntley, who's one of Australia's best social researchers, author of the new, new book, How to Talk About Climate Change in a Way That Makes a Difference. I urge everyone to go off after we finish this chat and go and order that book because I finished it this afternoon and it was fantastic. Oh, good. We're also joined by Matt Brown, who's a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress and the founder of Global Progress Alliance. And as well, as, as well we're joined by Marcus Roberts, who's the International Projects Director at YouGov. So welcome everybody. Um, thank you to the three of you for being panelists for what I think is going to be another fantastic discussion. Um, and as always, I'll start with a general question, which I'll ask Rebecca to answer first and then Matt and then uh, I guess the question is, how do you see COVID affecting people's politics and their sense of co social cohesion? Well, <laughs> I suppose uh, we have to work out um, really what phase of the um, pandemic we can accurately measure whether, and I love your Camus um, way of opening things, whether this is, whether the things that, um, you know, qualities and characteristics of our society that are positive and bring us together are emphasised and the negatives, which there's always going to be both positive and negatives, and the negatives are perhaps not as prevalent, um, and do you compare it to the first three months, six months, and how we go on? I suppose in Australia, the research that the very early research that we started, I started to either be involved in or to see, showed a slightly different, so quite a lot of contradictions. Um, from a methodological point of view, and I'd be really interested in Marcus's view, I wondered whether to, um, whether people's anxiety or kind of sense of like trying to get their mind around this um, because it was so unprecedented really affected the way in which um, they um, were answering questions, you know. So, I mean, I think, you know, if you were kind of measuring the anxiety of Melburnians in the last week, it would go up and down with the various numbers. So, um, I mean, I think, I think that what I'm feeling now and what we're seeing now and some of the stuff coming out of Essential and in some of the qualitative research that I've done in the last couple of weeks is that, um, is that people were pretty pretty good, pretty stable, pretty really, really, really pleased with what they saw as um, some kind of consensus amongst political leaders, not to play too much politics with COVID. But now with this kind of second wave and this sense that it's not going to be okay by Christmas um, and that it's my, and a vaccine might be one or two years away, I think we're going to start to see the kinds of political divisions we've seen in America, which we've been pretty much... Um, are pretty pretty much absent here. Start to um, start to kind of uh, raise their ugly heads, and I'm waiting to see what business leader or what sector is going to come out and say, "Look, we, we you know, it, what's going to what's going to be better? People killing themselves because of an economic downturn, or people over 75 who perhaps didn't have much time on this earth anyway dying? Like, I, I think we're going to start to see that kind of stuff happen." And, and uh, while that won't be the majority view in the Australian community, 
it may start to take hold in some parts of, um, let's say, some some parts of the Australian community and then we'll start to get those political divisions. Yeah, that's a great point. I think already, I think there's uh, some business leaders uh, teetering around the edges of what I call the let it rip mentality, but yeah. um, that's a great point we can come back to as well. Uh, Matt, what about you? How are you, you know, you've got this uh, scope of things across Europe, across America as well, um, with your many hats. Um, you know, how do you see how this is shaping people's social values and, and, uh, and political polarization? So in most countries, although I think the US is an outrider and an exception to this, but in most countries, I think in the initial period, what you saw first of all was a rallying around the flag. Even, if, even in countries where people were disappointed uh, by the initial short-term response of governments, uh, there was a kind of a glue factor. Um, people felt like that you had to come together and solve uh, this crisis. But my own personal view on the data that I've seen is that COVID is not a glue. It's not an adhesive that's gonna bring us together. It's actually an accelerant. And by that, I mean uh, the kind of structural trends that our society was facing, whether that's the the need to move towards a, a, a better climate policy, whether that's to do with the impact of technology on the normal economy, whether that's to do with so underlying social divisions between generations, between urban uh, and rural regions. What you see is I, I, that conflict becoming actually more pronounced over, over time. And so in a lot of the data, um, Although people want change, what you see is, you know, you, you mentioned Camus, but I think like the sort of hell is other people uh, is actually a, a better analogy, which is people want change, but what they have is a confirmation bias. So if you are in favor of uh, strong action on climate, you think COVID proves that now it, that, both, that, human act, that we can solve this problem if we work together and that all the money we spend on recovery should be targeted in that way. If you are... Uh, an authoritarian populist and you believe that we should be closing borders, we should be insourcing all of our production, particularly in, in fragile sectors, then you are convinced that, that, that COVID has proven that we need stricter control of borders, that we need to insource uh, essential production. So, it, so that kind of confirmation bias is embedded in. And so I think we're entering a period now where while there was an initial rally around the flag, uh, what you're seeing is is that those those deeper structural tensions are re-emerging, and and people's feelings and convictions towards those that the, the worldview they have are stronger than they were before they went into the crisis. Absolutely. So my expectation is is that as politics returns, it may become more polarized than it was before the crisis. It might be worth adding off the back of um, Matt's uh, comments is. And this may disappoint those people on the um, on the line that thought that the bushfires we had in Australia was a kind of a tipping point that would make everybody realise, oh, climate change is real and here, um, here really in the present day. All the research I've done and all the research I've seen has shown that all the bushfires did was make people who were concerned, some people who were concerned alarmed and everybody else doubled down on their already existing position on climate. Um, so if you were somebody who was uh, doubtful or dismissive about climate change, you thought the fires were because of greenies, because you blame greenies on, you can't think greenies are, you know, blame on everybody else. If you were disengaged from the climate issue, you would often say in focus groups or in surveys, oh, I don't know what caused it, or oh, maybe it's cyclical and we can't control it. It was just quite extraordinary. So one of the big mistakes that the progressive climate movement made in Australia is they thought they didn't have to really go on the offensive around the language around the fires, that it would be absolutely obvious to people that this was climate change and we were completely basically outfoxed by the Murdoch media, um, knowing that all they needed to do was message to those dismissive, doubtful, disengaged, cynical people about why that happened. So I think that any crisis uh, that can't be ignored has that has that kind of effect of making people in it, it help it has it has the possibility to entrench people's views um, and make the views that they already had seem more urgent. Um, yeah. yeah. So Marcus, I might go to you now because you've got some slides to share with us on on exactly this sort of stuff in particular. Uh, how 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 partisan lenses, particularly in the US, are are shaping people's perceptions of 
of responses to COVID and deepening their already uh, deeply felt partisan uh, views, uh, which is you know, the issue that Matt and Rebecca have both touched on. So over to you. Sure, that's right, and, and, and thank you for that, Brett. Um, Daniel, would you mind pulling up the, the first slide um, on summary, please? So if we turn to the first slide, um, we can see uh, uh, the central point I want to make here is that um, uh, what Rebecca was just saying is completely right, um, that uh, the way in which politics in the pandemic has played out in the, the US particularly um, has been to confirm people in their preset partisan lenses. Very much like what Matt said, this is acting as an accelerant um, rather than um, a, a change phenomenon uh, for people's pre-existing politics. Uh, so in the US, um, uh, Americans are more than twice as likely to trust medical advice from Dr. Fauci as distrust it sh overall, but Democrats are more likely to uh, trust the advice of experts rather than Republicans. Republicans being less likely to wear a face mask. Lockdown measures, um, on the other hand, in Australia, tend to be on a more bipartisan uh, basis. And that's something that we see across the board. Now, an important caveat to all of this is the fact that in, Aust in Australia, um, uh, you've got about 277 cases of COVID-19 per million Australians. Whereas in the US, you've got 3,900 cases of COVID per million. Um, and, and, and that, of course, is going, so you've got a, a problem that is 14 times as bad in the US as it is in Australia, and that will definitely be having an unusual effect in and of itself. So we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, here's that Fauci slide in detail showing the breakdown. And this is important because Dr. Fauci is such a trusted figure for liberals and seeing how that story is somewhat different. And indeed, as the crisis has gone on, um, support and trust for Dr. Fauci amongst Republicans has really fallen quite dramatically. Uh, if we look at the... Marcus, is this, partly why, is this partly why the White House has been out there this week uh, undermining Fauci? Yes, and if we uh, skip two slides along, please, actually, um, you, we'll see that. Uh, yes, so uh, from March to July, Republican trust in Dr. Fauci has fallen by 18 points. Um, one of the reasons uh, for that is um, the, the uh, strong Trump and Trump media attack um, on expert and establishment and medical and scientific opinion in this crisis. Um, to give you an example of how that plays out, uh, in terms of support or opposition for lockdown measures. If you are a consumer of Breitbart news, um, at the cutting edge, if you will, um, of, of far or hard right Republican um, media and, 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 and Trump supporting opinion, you are 70% um, on opposition to lockdown measures. If, you're a, if your primary media consumption is Fox News, you're at 39% opposition to lockdown measures. If you, on the other hand, consume the Washington Post as your primary um, piece of media, then 12% opposition to lockdown measures, or MSNBC, 11% uh, opposition to lockdown measures. And that it shows you in a very dramatic way how the media and political environment is informing the partisan views. If we could go to the previous slide, actually, you'll see how that has played out across institutions um, and individuals overall, with this strong and, and growing partisan split uh, between Democrats and Republicans, even to the point of, of course, the, me the medical media personalities, even where they're not actually medical doctors, um, being more likely to receive a higher degree of Republican support. Uh, and this is really, really striking. And of course, it's even more clear um, as time has gone on, and these are, uh, the, these are the April figures, if I were to show you the July figures, which we haven't published yet, you would see an even more dramatic picture with regard to declining support for even the, the Center for Disease Control in the US, um, even smaller support amongst Republicans for Dr. Fauci, even less support um, for the WHO, um, whilst trust in, in media celebrities continues to rise on the Republican side, which, which is, is, is unfortunate in this crisis. Um, if we can move along a little bit more, please, we can see um, to the more Democrats are worried about uh, COVID-19 than Republicans. Um, this is uh, what is driving 
those that that difference in trust numbers uh, very clearly on on both fronts. And then the next slide shows how Republicans are simply less likely to wear a face mask. And Brett, I'd be very happy for you to share this uh, deck with whoever it is that, that needs it thereafter, as I'm aware I'm running through it at a fairly quick clip. Um, on the next slide, we're just gonna sum up some of the Australia data that we've had. Um, now the bipartisan and science-based approach in Australia um, has led to a more united population in Australia, particularly in comparison um, with uh, uh, the US. And I know that in the wake of, 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 of by-elections and uh, given the, the feverish nature at the best of times of Australian partisan politics, it may not always feel that way, but statistically there really isn't much comparison in terms of partisanship um, between the two, the two continent countries. Um, so next up, uh, uh, we're going to have a look at how lockdown measures have more support and are less polarizing in Australia um, when comparison, uh, in comparison to uh, the US. Um, and the final point um, that we have in the, the, uh, is um, that Trump and Biden supporters on our next slide are more divided over trust of medical opinions, whereas in Australia, um, look at those numbers, like 96 and 98, 8%. Um, just just so uh, incredibly clear. Now there's some other points about uh, climate change, about stress and anxiety levels, um, uh, about our desire um, for social cohesion or for social justice measures. We can all get into, I'm sure, in the Q&A, but for now I'll leave it there. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, Marcus. That's a, that's a nice, your last slide there's a nice end to, to one of the questions I wanted to ask you all, and that is, you know, we, we uh, believe, or well, we seem to believe, that that we're back believing in experts and stuff. Yet even today, I uh, saw a former Australian Prime Minister who might be charitably described as a climate change denier uh, um, out there saying that he thought that Australians were too enthralled uh, to experts and expertise. So the question I put is, um, has has this crisis restored our faith in expertise? I mean, it seemed from your last slide there, Marcus, that that there was uh, a lot of support for medical experts in Australia. But, but have we turned this, uh, this sort of suspicion of experts that was driving Brexit and other things in recent years around and on its head? Uh, I might start with you and then, and then Rebecca and Matt. Um, yes, yeah, so, so, so what I'd say there is that um, uh, support for experts, and this comes back to Matt's uh, point about it being an accelerant, um, continues to rise amongst the liberal left cosmopolitan voters uh, that you would expect it to rise by. Um, there has been some encouraging signs of, of, of a more united approach in Australia and also in the UK um, with regard to um, backing up for experts. That has not been the case in, in the US at all. I also think um, that it's generally overstated uh, in, in media narratives about this as to how much faith the public place in experts. Rather, if I was trying to think of like the, 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 the big political lesson to take from this, in, especially in terms of political communications, it would be that frontline practitioners continue to be your best message carriers. Um, uh, if you were trying to think of who to drive a message um, about politics after the pandemic, um, I'd be looking to your nurses and your cleaners, um, your doctors, um, uh, your frontline um, support staff workers, um, your teachers, all of the people who have actually um, had to reinvent our economy, our society, uh, and our public services through this crisis. And I think that those are the groups actually that you would discover far more general levels of, of, of uh, trust and indeed increased levels of trust in as a consequence of this before we even came onto the experts discussion. Rebecca? Uh, look, I, I think, all the data that I've looked at shows that Australians' trust of certain expertise has remained reasonably strong, you know, over time. I mean, it has been whittled away, but it's had a full frontal assault on it for a long time, you know, by various parts of um, the media, whether that be on climate change or anything. But, but for example, um, all the trust indexes that are around show that, you know, we still trust medical expert, you know, we've talked about doctors, people with degrees, you know, we, um, 
we have a lot of faith and trust in the CSIRO, the High Court, you know what I mean? Anybody, so I think that in, in Australia that's got quite as bad as it's been elsewhere. And of course, but there is that partisanism and difference. Looking at one of Marcus's slides, the thing that, which was, which showed kind of Australians feeling that the government had managed the, the, the pandemic um, fairly well, it was almost at 68% with some people saying, no, they need to be tougher and other people saying, that no, they need to be more lenient. You know, if things go on and the economy gets worse and worse, I can kind of feel that consensus, because I think that consensus is held up because people have felt like it's not been as bad as elsewhere. We actually haven't had a significant number of deaths. We've had lots of, um, you know, for our friends overseas, when we say, oh, we had so, and you know, Melbourne had, you know, 233, um, people diagnosed with COVID, they're often shocked that it's not 233 people who died of COVID, you know what I mean? So I think that we, I think that success breeds trust in many ways. But when we start to um, have less success, I think different people will start to trust the expertise less. They'll start to say, well, you know, it's all going well and you can kind of see the chief medical officers standing next to the prime minister. Oh, isn't it good that we've got expert led policy decision making and then when things perhaps go off the rails you'll start to see that you'll start to see that happy consensus whittled away from either side with more people saying no 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 we need to be tougher the experts aren't being you know they're being too cautious and other people saying the experts are being you know so we we sometimes we see what we want to see in these kinds of scenarios based on not necessarily rational views from all sides, but what we think is working and what we really want to have happen. Okay. Matt, what about um, what you're seeing when you look across Europe? I, mean, I know there's been very different responses to different countries across Europe, but but what do you see in the countries particularly that have handled, uh, well, have seemed to have handled the pandemic well across Europe and those that sort of haven't? How is that changing this dynamic in terms of expertise and trust? Uh, uh, I'll come to that, but there's, I'd like to say one thing about the UK first and the role of experts in politics, um, which, you know, in the early days of the crisis in the UK, we, we, you know, we have a government that's led by people like Johnson and Gove, who basically said Britain's had enough of experts. And in the onset of the crisis, they deferred every decision to experts, or at least they presented politically. They're like, we're just doing what the scientists tell us to do. Um, and so uh, it's, it's been interesting to see how, as, as that government begins to disagree with the advice of scientists, they distance themselves. So it used to be that the chief medical officer and the chief health officer would appear every day alongside cabinet ministers presenting the evidence and the argument. And once there was a disagreement between the, the scientists and the politicians, uh, the statistics became harder to find uh, uh, and were less, you know, less available in public or, or less promoted by the government. Uh, and they appeared less. So I, so I think that, you know, th this is less about statistics and experts and much more about the relationship between political leadership and experts. And, and that changes and, and morphs over time. And I think generally people, people are trusting of expert knowledge. What they are untrusting of uh, is governments and politicians that try and present themselves as experts or manipulate expert knowledge. And they're quite attuned to that, um, uh, at least outside of, of the U.S., when you look across Europe, I mean, like, let's take Scandinavia, for, for example. I mean, there are, there are two competing approaches in Scandinavia. One was an early lockdown, uh, very swift. Um, so you look at Denmark, you look at Norway, they had a limited number of deaths. Uh, and the economy opened up. And people really trust, you know, trust in Meta Fredriksson in, the, in Denmark, for example, has increased accordingly, uh, as it has with the, the, the Norwegian government. And that's got nothing to do with the left-right divide. It's got to do with swift action, uh, even if in both cases they were a little bit slow in the initial sort of two or three weeks, but then there was really dramatic action. But on the other hand, you have Sweden, uh, which has pursued a dramatically different policy, um, essentially a, a strategy to try and develop herd immunity. Um, and yet, amongst Swedes, the government is incredibly popular and the measures they've taken are popular. Uh, so they've had a much higher death rate, but the Swedish public uh, have, have been tolerant of that. Mm -hmm. And I think this comes to the, the, the issue that there is disagreement between the, uh, between the experts. So some people will, will say, you know, like, we need to prepare for a second wave. That second wave is going to come. 
Uh, and so a managed approach that, is let, that doesn't try to eradicate the disease in the early stages is the ve best approach, whereas others have gone for eradication. And so, you know, like, I think, you know, it may well be too early to tell. It, you know, if it is two years till we, till we have a, a vaccine, then we're not sure which of the experts or which group of experts might be right. And I think that's the tension. You know, we, we can talk because any expert will have to basically make an assessment about the longevity of the of the medical threat um, versus the, the the other threats posed. And then if you look, uh, you know, and also the different statistics that you take into account, whether you're looking at excess deaths uh, and over a period of time, if we're shutting down all other medical services, you know, people are not receiving cancer treatment. Uh, uh, there are lots of undiagnosed cancers now emerging. We're not we're not sure what the medical impact of that is, and so th so this is where I I, I have a, a trouble with the like are we valuing experts or not? Um, experts are being used by different politicians at different times to advance particular arguments, but I think you know it's very hard to say we're following the scientific evidence when this is a new disease that nobody really knows. Uh, you know we learn new things about how the disease is mutating every single day, um, so following the experts on this is is tough. So, so I guess that leads into um, trust in government and uh, and where we see government being. And I know you know there were a lot of us. Uh, I'm as guilty as as the next progressive of this. That sort of six weeks ago, a month ago, we we're all uh, you know in 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 the belief that big government was back, that the world had bought into big government because there are all these governments, even stimulus pro safety band aid programs happening. I mean, have, have we, from sort of the research that the three of you have seen, have we seen this increase in support for government and big government beyond the immediate needs of looking after the pandemic and a rethinking of the role of government and government as a force for good? I mean, have voters bought into this sort of government is a force for good um, frame for the long term or just for this pandemic? Uh, Rebecca, I might start with you. Yeah, um, look, I mean, I think we all noticed a, a general at the beginning of the, the first kind of phase of it a bit of an uptick for all leaders generally which may be a kind of a um and even for opposition leaders interestingly and that that may be a mixture of things it could be a reflection of people's endorsement of politicians coming together putting aside partisan politics and you know let's all let's all solve this problem it could be what happens you know that deep evolutionary kind of, you know, survival mechanism, which is in a, pa in a state of chaos and panic, we have to turn to somebody. So, <laughs> um, so we turn to our leaders and if they look like they're doing something um, that, you know, we broadly agree with, we feel happy with. Um, interestingly, in the research that I've been doing, and this has mostly been qualitative research in the last couple of weeks, um, I think that, I think that while people want government to help, They're ang the same anxieties they always feel about when government decide to spend money right, you know, come up with people. They go, well, you know, they're giving money to this sector or they're keeping this sector. They're doing a lot here, but not a lot there. And they're kind of doing all this. And so, so where's the agenda? They're thinking about, they're not questioning that the levers need to be pulled and money needs to be spent. They're wondering who's getting paid and whether this is effective. So if you're on the more progressive side, you're wondering whether, you know, big business and the kinds of people that donate to politicians and have politicians' ears are the ones that um, are getting most of the money and getting, um, and, and or whether other people are being overlooked. So I think that those kinds of general, that general concern and the questioning about what is the right and wrong thing to do um, comes up. From a climate change point of view, we know that, um, we know that the current federal government have put an enormous emphasis on gas, this idea that we have this kind of, you know, we're going to have a gas-led economic recovery. Um, lots of other people are trying to make a, I think, a very kind of reasonable, I would say a reasonable argument that this is an opportunity to accelerate a move towards um, renewable energy and renewable energy projects. Um, but I think, you know, what emerges out of this in so many ways is a sense of, you know, what is the real shape of the Australian economy? To what extent does the government, with good or bad policy, shape this for better or for worse? For it, and and people always think that that's got to do with who their mates are and 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 um, what their political agenda is. So, 
I think to say that this is a re-emphasis in the minds of Australians of the benefits of governments and over overstatement. They think that, that government should do things. They're just questioning what the effective outcome is. And Matt, what about what about what you're seeing and hearing from different different jurisdictions? But also, I guess, what is the, what's given given government has re-engaged in this way? What's the sort of path forward for progressives to to embed this idea that government can be a force for good? So I think uh, I, I would offer a, a word of caution towards progressives thinking that now is the moment, you know, like the evidence is on our side, the public now support government. I think there is, there, is, there is an understanding that in this unprecedented time, this action has been required. Um, but a lot of the data that I've seen about future projections and future views increasingly the future looks like wouldn't it be great if we can go a little bit back to where we were before so when people look at the future uh, and talk about the future what they talk about is things going back a little bit more to normal yes they want to use the opportunity to fix some some problems but it's more nuanced than sort of like this is now the moment for another big push in fact a, a lot of the evidence um uh tim dixon presented this a little yesterday or this morning, your time, yesterday, our time, on the call that you and I were on, Brett, shows that, you know, that people just sort of want things to go back to, to the way they were. We can use the opportunity a little bit to fix some of the problems, some of the inequalities, but there's not a huge desire on the part of the public to do another great big push. They feel like they're making an enormous effort in adjusting the way they live, the way they consume, the way they work, and the way they interact with their family already. The idea that then when, when we get out on the other side of COVID, we're going to go through all of this again to, to make another radical transformation of society. There isn't a hunger there for it. So I think what that points to um, is that if you want to make a push on climate, you've got to tie it intimately to a return to normal, uh, to, a, to, to, the, to a, a, a restart of the economy. And it has to be, it, those messages has to be they almost symbiotic or intimately linked. The same with anything else that you want to do around issues of migration or public policy or otherwise. The one area where there is strong appetite, uh, in Europe at least, for perhaps more radical reform is on health systems. You know, people have become acutely aware that some of their health systems are very strained, uh, public health systems in particular, um, with government funding, and there is a greater desire to, to put support into those. Um, although that may wane uh, and dwindle if, uh, if we find a vaccine in the next you know, two or three months, people may, that may drop down on the, uh, on the list of priorities. Oh, Matt, so don't tease us that. with vaccine conversations <laughs> Christmas. That's a horrible thing to do. It's like, it's a terrible thing. <laughs> Oh. Hey, so Marcus, um, turning this, I guess, question on its head, what about in countries where the response has been clearly botched? How is this turn showing up in terms of people actually increasing their mistrust of the government and their, their belief that government actually can't fix things? Yes, and, and to that end, um, I posted in the chat uh, a link to the YouGov um, COVID-19 monitor, uh, which uh, tracks government approval, um, uh, patterns of compliance and concern, sources of anxiety with regard to the crisis uh, across 26 different countries, so that people for themselves can play with the data and do that on a cross-country uh, comparison to see um, where and why uh, perhaps things have, have played out in different ways. Uh, and that, that might be the best way of answering your question directly on a country by country basis. I'd like to, to pick up, if I may, a couple of points, one political and one about the environment um, from what we discussed. Uh, the political point, I think, speaks, uh, uh, builds on what Matt was just saying about what it is that voters want next. Um, and I think the word that is most helpful to understand how, how voters are feeling almost globally right now is exhausted. Um, the global financial crisis. Uh, the, before that, there was the war on terror. After the global financial crisis, you had a series of very highly emotional elections all over the world, from Australia to the, to the US, to the UK, living in an age of Trump politically, where no matter what country you live in, um, he, uh, his presence in your social media and in your mainstream media is, is so extraordinary. And then you have the pandemic. 
you put all of these things together, um, uh, the kind of voter who decides elections, which is to say perhaps not a voter um, of, of a more high education, high income, category, liberal and, and cosmopolitan category, is just so tired of all of this politics. And so if we turn to them and now and say, now's the time for another big thing and another big change and another transformation in your life and our world, uh, I wouldn't be at all surprised if they didn't actually turn as a consequence um, to those politicians who are offering them a narrative that is based more on reassurance for the past. We see this a little bit in, in some concerning data I can share um, that YouGov has done with the German newspaper Handelsblatt, um, looking at attitudes towards climate change and the environment, mm -hmm. where across the board, for those countries that we looked at in, in Europe, um, we've seen declining concern about climate change as a con um, parallel to con rising concern about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. in, in Britain, climate change as a top two issue um, has fallen from 19% to 11%. In France, it's fallen from 30% to 22%. In Germany, from 27 to 20. In Denmark, from 35 to 18. And again, I'll be happy to, to share this data with you, Brett, to, to, to put out through Shipley um, afterwards as you see fit. Um, and then, and then uh, across um, Scandinavia, um, similar, albeit smaller, um, measures of, of decline, more like um, low to, to, to mid single digits rather than double digits. Um, nonetheless, it does say to me that when I look at indicators of where our politics is heading next, um, that, that this exhaustion factor for voters is something that people are going to really need to take into account in thinking about political messaging in the future. Yeah, I must say, when you listed all those things, I felt tired just listening to them. <laughs> Let alone having lived through them for the last 20 years as well. Or, or polling them. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, yes, yes. Not just living through them, but polling them. Exactly, exactly. So I, I want to move on to a slightly different uh, tangent now, and that is, um, you know, what, what sort of social tensions, I guess, have we seen emerging through this COVID and, and, and the various responses to it and how it's affected different people? I mean, you know, men versus women, for instance, you know, we know that women have been hit harder economically in three separate ways from, from, this, uh, from this pandemic, uh, young versus old, the health aspects, but, but also social togetherness aspects, um, you know, and, and, and the workers aspect, you know, white collar, uh, you know, still in, still in jobs mainly, working from home, those on the front line putting themselves at risk, uh, and, you know, and those who are newly unemployed. I mean, what other social tensions have you seen building or how do you think those ones that I've just listed might yeah. play into... Uh, the future and, and, and what it means for politics of societies? Well, I suppose, uh, I mean, all of those are exactly right, Brad. I suppose I would add to that, um, there has been over the last 10 years, and I've seen it in my quality of research, probably more than 10, a very, a, quite a complex Australian view about the role of China. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I think this just adds a new kind of, uh, toxic mix, a toxic kind of um, addition to that, including all the kind of quite dramatic changes that have happened to Australians, uh, the government's foreign policy in relation to China. So I, I but at the same time also realising that, that not, I mean, not just China, but the reliance of the tertiary education sector on foreign students, not just from China, but elsewhere, but China is a big part of that being um, really important. So, so, so there is this can't, don't want to live with them, can't live without them, a <laughs> um, general attitude of the Australian population to China. And so this adds yet another addition to this. And our international guests wouldn't know that, you know, 60 Minutes did a story on China talking about, you know, suing China for breaking the world with um, coronavirus. So there's that, but I think the other thing that's really interested me, and you know, it's 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 come and gone over the um, over the life uh, lifespan of the virus, is the a generational tension, and those generational tensions exist in discussions around climate change. But this kind of you know, and it, and it manifests itself in blaming at at various stages, blaming young people for being super spreaders and not caring about it. Um, and then other people saying, well, basically older people 
um, anybody, you know, they're, they're kind of, if they, if they all kind of shuffle off this mortal coil, maybe a couple of years earlier than they would normally, we can live with that. So there is just kind of, you know, um, a huge tension, um, generational tension around this that comes as well. Matt? Yeah, I'd agree very much with that last point um, about the generational tension. And I think that will get worse because as we see, you know, like the millennial generation are already those that find it ha hardest to get housing, uh, have much lower opportunities than previous generations. And we're now going to go into a period of economic slowdown where those people who are leaving education and tran transiting into the, the labor market are going to find it much tougher and have w much worse conditions. And we know that historically those cohorts that entered during a, 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 a depressed, a depression or a recession carry that, uh, carry that impact for a long period of time. So I, so I think that that tension will, will continue to grow because I don't, I don't, we, I, it'd be quite easy um, to find somebody, you know, like to, you just need a talented young millennial campaigner who's basically like, look, these people have mortgaged our future and yet, yet again, we're the ones paying the price for this. So I, I think that's a tension that will emerge. I think just also to pick up on, uh, on the China issue, I think the, the role that China has played and the, the image of China around the world has, has gone through waves. I mean, in the very early days of the crisis in Europe, China uh, was aggressively pushing itself as a, a, a good pub, public actor, global public actor, you know, shipping over um, uh, blood plasma of people who'd had COVID to facilitate research, um, sharing uh, protective equipment. Yet over the last few months, well, in the last sort of month, six weeks, you've seen a dramatic fall in the image of China. Um, that's partly people sort of saying that it, they didn't manage the crisis properly, they weren't transparent. It's also more broadly about the way the Chinese state and the Communist Party is operating. So in the UK, you know, we've now banned Huawei from our 5G rollout. And so I think in some ways, what we've seen is the rise of China as a global player. And it's exacerbated what I think are the tensions within the, the liberal international order and that shown our inability to work together with China. And I think that's a, a further tension that's emerging beyond those that you mentioned. So, you know, for me, it's, it's the degree of interstate cooperation on trying to find a vaccine or setting the parameters about how vaccines will be distributed is, is shocking. If you think back to the, the, the years of the human genome, then there was a project that was set up by Blair and Clinton. They set out quite explicitly that this was research for humanity and it should be a public good. We're a long way away from that in this crisis, yet in some ways the, the impact of COVID on, on global politics and, and the global economy is, is far greater than that of, of the human genome. I, I mean, there was a letter, I think Jacinda Ardern, Pedro Sanchez, uh, Justin Trudeau and, and Stefan Leuven published a, a letter alongside some uh, I, I think that the president of Tunisia uh, yesterday, your time, uh, uh, basically outlining that we, you know, this, this, the vaccine should go to who needs it most rather than to be uh, some kind of for-profit thing. But that failure of international collaboration, I mean, it's worse than, than eight years ago with the global financial crisis. There is a complete lack of international leadership and actually tensions amongst global powers about how, how we manage this crisis. And that for me, I find particularly worrying because I don't see a way through that uh, right now. And it certainly doesn't augur well for any international cooperation on climate change going forward, does it? I mean, but even, I mean, I notice this tension even, even here. We're now at a position of uh, a state versus state uh, in, in Australia, really. Um, states turning on each other with the new clusters uh, growing in Victoria, uh, which, of course, um, you know, there's in, in the US, and I'd be interested, I guess, in your view on this, Marcus, it seems there's a this competitive, uh, in a nasty way, competitive tension in the US between states already as well. So um, what's your take on this, Marcus, on these emerging fractures in society? Yeah, I, I, I think, again, we come back to this, this problem of um, how the pandemic, like the global financial crisis before it, um, like uh, the, the, the people's positions on Brexit or Trump, continues to serve as an accelerant for pre-existing cleavages in our politics um, and, and for, for um, the development of, of partisanship. Um, and uh, uh, when it comes to, to the specifics of, of how that play out, um, yes, there can be some very ugly instances of that. Um, so uh, uh, some of the competition between the states, 
particularly in some of the uh, in the US uh, and how the federal government has indeed um, set up under President Trump the states to compete with each other and to compete with the federal government for PPE equipment, um, for respirators, for ventilators, um, uh, the, the way in which the federal government has managed procurement rules um, to lead to a competition between private health care providers and, and, and public health care providers um, has, has had very real world and, and very tragic costs, actually. Uh, so I don't think we can, we can underestimate that. Um, and so even if, if uh, government is not necessarily back as something that everyone wants to see in the long term being um, a, a larger, more powerful force in people's lives, I think there is, however, a desire for competent governments to be back. <laughs> um, even if you don't want government to be doing more, you do want government to be doing it better. Um, now, I, I should caveat that by saying the public would generally support government doing more um, uh, as a response to this crisis, but that does not necessarily mean they want governments to be doing more um, after this crisis has been, hopefully, sorted somehow. What may well last, however, overall, and this is some hope, actually, is um, the exposure um, of... Uh, uh, of, 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 of the uh, Bolsonaro's, of the Trumps, um, of those who have mishandled um, their COVID response so extraordinarily ba badly uh, that, that that leads to a greater appreciation um, even amongst what we might call Trump Brexit voters um, uh, of the importance of having leaders who can have a grip on um, bureaucracies that do actually make the difference between life and death in crises such as this. Yeah, but Marcus, don't you think, I mean, I, I've also seen people say, oh, you know, COVID is the kind of death of these, you know, strongman populist leaders. But Donald Trump's had to kill a lot of people to become unpopular. <laughs> he's had to really, I mean, you know, he, he's really had to, um, really screw up badly to see some of these suppressed numbers again I, I wouldn't get i wouldn't let i wouldn't allow us as progressive people to get too excited about you know that this is the end of those kinds of leaders like i said i'm still it, it's still extraordinary that people um support him given what's happened and yeah the numbers the, they're just the sheer numbers of death yeah but it, it may have taken something as dramatic as as this crisis to have arrested um, the, the, the fall in support for, shall we say, traditional social democracy on the other yeah. hand, yeah. Where, where traditional social democracy has let down so many working people over such a long yeah. period of time because the, 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 the response to, um, to low wages was more welfare or yeah. the response to high unemployment was more part-time jobs all yeah. of which created a fragility in our political economy, which of course laid the groundwork for, for these, these um, uh, ruptures in our politics. Yeah. So I think that perhaps the long-term um, uh, economic uh, picture of decline was so great, it took something as dramatic as, as an issue of life or death to actually adjust people's frames. Now, if that means that, that um, social democrats and even traditional conservatives of the mainstream right now actually take this as a moment to reset their political economic thinking um, into something that it can appeal to to lower income lower education voters then there's an opportunity i think long term to move people's political interests away from those kind of leaders if there isn't then then you're quite right it will return to, to the status quo ante i know you have to drop off in, in a minute marcus a little bit early so i just want to say thank you for being uh, for being part of this uh, but I think my absolute pleasure. I'm sorry I'm going to have to go a little bit early, but uh, my wife is pregnant and we have a hospital appointment and we're very, very excited to, you know, uh, take wow. advantage of, of an NHS that is still standing and still able to help <laughs> us out on that. Excellent. Well, congratulations on all that and thanks for being part of it. I, I ask, <laughs> Thank you, guys. I do want to ask Matt and Rebecca about one other, one other issue before we come to a bit of a close, and that's obviously you know, with COVID has been such an important driver in recent months, but there's been another massive social issue that's also really exploded in recent months. And that's, of course, um, the focus on systemic and structural racial injustice following the murder of George Floyd and the worldwide Black Lives Matter process. Mm -hmm. And I think we'd be remiss if we didn't, when we're talking about solidarity and, and, and cleavages in society, talk about 
how you see that having played out uh, into the issues of, these issues of polarization and solidarity that we've uh, that we've been talking about already tonight. So who wants to have first stab at that? Wow. Matt, do you want to try? Uh, I, I, I'm happy to. Um, it's a big issue to de address in sort of six minutes, but uh, oh, I'll make unfortunately. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, you know, that, that you shouldn't underestimate the, the degree to which um, Trump's response to this has, as well has been an impact on his numbers moving, right? And the way that he has fueled this crisis. When you re the moment when he turned the National Guard on peaceful protesters for a photo opportunity was was a pivotal moment in many people's minds, um, uh, in terms of who he was as an individual, right? Uh, the, the people that that I know who are li still living in Washington D.C. Th this was a, this this was a moment of crystallization for them, uh, but also around around the country. Um, you know, so I spent a lot of time uh, in Arkansas, uh, which is not a liberal state. Um, and, you know, the, the degree to which a militarized police immediately came out to protect monuments and, and co the courthouse, you know, people were in shock at this. Um, and so I, I think it, it, it's had a profound moment. What I worry about on the, the progressive side, um, you know, and, and I think what's happened is it, it's, it's transcended into popular culture. When you get Premier League, all Premier League footballers, for example, taking the knee before the games that start. This has become something that is now, you know, entered into the, uh, a much more popular culture understanding of this issue. Where I worry about um, uh, the progressive movement here is uh, a little around overreach and what, what, you, what the, the right are calling the cancel culture. Um, so, you know, on, you know, while we've seen, I think, a, a great acceptance of the degree to which there are structural racial injustices in the UK, the US and elsewhere. What you've also seen is um, the, the alt-right using this as a, as a mobilization moment, uh, a huge mobilization moment. So the Black Lives Matter protests in, in, in the UK were followed by the Protect the Statues movement, movement and the, what they call the Football Lads Alliance, which is basically a bunch of football hooligans who are linked to the far right, coming out and standing in front of, you know, statues of Churchill or wherever. So on, on the one hand, it's sort of, I think, uh, ha has given us a much greater understanding um, of, uh, of, the, of the structural injustices in our society. On the other hand, in some ways, the response of the left has pro provoked and been, and been manipulated uh, by, by the, the far right to, to mobilize their people. So I, I don't necessarily see this as a healing moment, but just another tension that, that we're gonna have to work through. Rebecca. I suppose the only thing I'd add to that is I'm I'm always interested in what what comes after a period of of massive national or international disruption and around the language of sacrifice. You know, we've all got to you know we've all got to pitch in and sacrifice in order to save you know society as it is. It's not surprising then that people who have constantly sacrificed and are going to do worse, you know, and kind of like they're, they're kind of go, well, what are we actually trying to say? So I think about coming out of the Vietnam War, and it was obviously there before, but a kind of more militant, um, you know, uh, civil rights movement, which is like, we're good enough to die in the, in the jungles of Vietnam, but not good enough to be treated as equals back in our own home. And so I wonder too, I mean, I'm not saying that these are necessarily connected because, um, you know, the kinds of things that have um, really sparked this kind of recent concern of, you know, Black Lives Matter existed, you know, existed for some time in different forms. But I do wonder at a kind of a mass psychological level, people think, well, we're all, we're all suffering, but who gets the benefit? You know, who suffers most, who gets the benefit? And at times of extraordinary disruption, maybe some people think, well, that disrupt, we want something more productive. We don't want to just go back to how things were before after these moments of disruption. So it's interesting, that, that itself is interesting to me. I'm not, I'm not being very definitive about it, but I kind of reflect on it at the point of um, that kind of mass psychological response, which is what I've been looking at in my work around climate, but I think it may well be evident there. 
Uh, we are I'm conscious that we are nearly at the top of the hour. So I'll finish with one last question to you both. And I think um, we've, for obvious reasons, touched on a lot of, one would say, less than cheery topics today, um, talking about the divisions in society. Um, so so uh, let, let's see if we can finish with a, with a happy, positive answer for our, uh, for our um, people uh, watching. Um, how do we as progressives use this period, both with COVID and increased focus on racial injustice, you know, to help forge, I guess, a new social compact, forge a new united policy consensus. I mean, uh, we've talked about a lot of barriers to that tonight, obviously. Mm -hmm. It'd be damn hard work, uh, like boring through hard boards with a spoon, I guess. But mm -hmm. is there something we can do, some hope we can give progressives about yeah. how we might forge that new consensus, that new compact? Yeah, so I've been pondering this a bit, because when I was doing, when I was looking at my climate change um, pages before it was going to the printer, one of the principles that comes out a lot in people who talk about resilience in the face of climate change is this phrase called get to know your neighbours. So it's the idea that strong communities find a way to support each other through times of crisis. And there has been quite a lot of, there's been some data that shows that people who are already friendly with their neighbours have got to know themselves a bit better, mainly because we can't get away from them, right? We're working from home. I'm certainly walking the dog around the streets a million times, so I'm getting to know my neighbours better. And I think what the opportunity there is for the progressive movement is that we tend to focus so much on big government, like big, you know, big federal government, big policy, and we forget, sometimes we don't always focus on the importance of of facilitating and supporting the local and we and I think that that's an unfair characterization of the progressive left but it's something that can happen so I think that I wonder whether this is an opportunity to talk about that in a kind of meaningful way for people and whether that be addressing climate change or addressing COVID how can how can that kind of how can the kind of trickle down social um social um cohesion happen? What can governments, federal and state governments do to really support and facilitate what are already these incredibly, when they thrive, wonderful local com organic community relationships that are going to get us through these kinds of things and are going to um, you know, help us face whatever crisis we've got to face? All politics is local. Yeah. For the last word. Thank you for now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, I think I, I agree with that point. Some of the data that um, uh, uh, Tim present, Tim Dixon presented for More in Common show that people's pride in their local community's response to this and people's affinity to their local community has risen massively during the, this crisis. Um, and, you know, part of that, they think, is related to a sense of agency that people could actually do things for their community. So you could go out and help a neighbor or you could support one another. And I think that, like, I agree with you, that I think progressives have often been very dismissive of local governance. It's not a big, bold policy, radical transformation. And so building things from the grassroots upwards is, it, it, is sort of dismissed slightly. So I, you know, I, I think that is a, a real opportunity. I, I also feel that, um, you know, Trumpism could still win in the US, but I think the way in which Biden um, has uh, in some ways been pulled into a more progressive position by what's happened in the US, both around the issue of climate. He uh, introduced an enormous climate package as part of his plan uh, yesterday. Um, uh, uh, I think the way that uh, the Black Lives Matter has moved him too, so that there's a stronger affinity between uh, the ethnic vote in America, between those who are support, you know, he's taken on much more of Sanders and AOC's agenda, even if he's not explicitly saying so. And so that's brought a greater unity towards a progressive community. And, uh, and I think that will provide an opportunity uh, for, for real change should he win, win in November. So I'm slightly, so I'm, I'm optimistic about both of those avenues. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, that's a, that's a lovely positive spot to finish. Um, thank you both. Thanks to Marcus in here. But thank you particularly, Rebecca and Matt, for being part of it tonight. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining in. This is the last of our second series of Chifley Conversations, but we will be back uh, in the not-too-distant future with some new events that we will let you all know about. Thanks, everybody, again, for supporting the Chifley Research Centre. Uh, I'd like to point out, for those who haven't seen it, obviously, last Monday was the 75th anniversary of our uh, namesake Ben Chifley becoming the Prime Minister of Australia and we put out a little 
uh, historical booklet to uh, to commemorate that event. So you can get that, find that on our website if you haven't uh, had the chance to download that already. But thank you everybody for being part of it. Thanks for your support of Chifley. Thanks to Rebecca and Matt. And obviously stay safe, everybody, because uh, we need you next time. You <laughs> Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, Brett, for all you do to keep us connected around the world with what's going on in Australia. It's really appreciated. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Bye. Bye.